Welcome to Mrs. True Crime. Today's video is an in-depth look into the unsolved murder of Beth Lynn Barr. It's a tale of conspiracy and fear. If you are triggered by anything dealing with harm to children, feel free to click off this video. Perhaps check out my gaming channel, Retail Me Games, for some lighthearted content. If not, I'm Nicole. Let's get started. Growing up, I was always taught about stranger danger and what to be on the lookout for. Avoid white vans, have a buddy system, if you end up in a strange place, look for an authority figure, and never go with anyone you don't know. However, there's actually three different kinds of kidnapping. Family kidnapping, acquaintance kidnapping, and stranger kidnapping. Of these, only 24% of kidnapping is done by strangers or acquaintances whereas 49% are done by a family member. But what about the kidnappings that go cold? What about the kidnappings that remain unsolved? Which direction should the police begin to look? Take the 1977 disappearance of Bethlen Barr, for example. Born December 20th, 1970, Bethlen Barr was a six-year-old girl from Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania. She was your typical little girl filled with joy and laughter and came from a typical family. Father Charles Barr was a policeman who was married to Donna Barr and together had one other child, James. James would often walk with his sister from school along with another friend of Beth's. But on Thanksgiving Day, 1977, that wouldn't be the case. Dressed in a red pantsuit, blue tennis shoes, and a plaid coat, Beth was looking forward to school. Even better, they were getting out early. Beth arrived to school without incident. But James was homesick, and Beth's friend had been picked up early, so Beth was left to walk from Johnson Elementary alone. She left the school at 2.15 p.m. and crossed the street with a large group of children, then walked alone heading up Ardmore Boulevard, turned left onto Marlboro Avenue, then immediately right onto Traymore Avenue. From here, witnesses would claim a man carried a young girl matching Beth's description into a dull blue sedan with red and white Ohio plates. When Beth didn't return home, her family grew worried and immediately began a search for her, but would fall short for a year. Before that year, they followed as many leads as they could muster. The morning Beth was taken at around 8.30 a.m. at a bus stop on Ardmore Boulevard, a young woman was harassed by a man who pulled off partially into an alley next to her. She couldn't recall his exact words but he said something obscene to her and she threatened to call the police. So he quickly got back into his car and left. She took note to write down his red and white license plate. That afternoon, as the police began canvassing the neighborhood, they approached her door and asked if she had seen or heard anything out of the ordinary and she reported the man and his car. She described him as unattractive, a white man in his 40s, about 5'10 to 5'11, medium build with medium brown curly hair, wearing a gray suit and square blue tinted shades. She said he looks like he would have an office job. The woman wouldn't hear any more about this man from the cops for another year. It seemed that the car and description the woman gave matched witness accounts of the man who took Beth. They followed up on the car, finding it at Colony's Motor Inn on Business Route 22 in Wilkins Township. It belonged to a car rental and hadn't been signed out of the days surrounding the kidnapping. The search for the car turned up nothing. Needing more manpower, the Wilkinsburg police entrusted law enforcement from other surrounding areas. Together they formed a sketch of the suspect that led to the arrest of Wilbur P. Hawthorne III. Hawthorne lived in McCandless, which is about 21 miles or a 33 minute drive from Wilkinsburg. He worked with his brother and father as manufacturing representatives supplying hardware to retail outlets in and around the county of Algamy. He was arrested on charges of kidnapping, unlawful felonies restraint, and aggravated assault. The subject of his arrest stringed from information from the Wilkinsburg authorities that alleged a history of unusual sexual practices. A sweep of his house uncovered clothing believed to have been worn by the kidnapper, 
but there wasn't any evidence showing that Beth had been inside his home. Employers of Hawthorne were shocked of his arrest, claiming he was a happy-go-lucky type and a real salt-of-the-earth kind. T. Lawrence Palmer, the Hawthorne's family advisor and close friend, said that Hawthorne was active in church groups, YMCA's, and the Algamy High School, where he worked with the youth from teaching them how to white water raft to going camping with them. Despite this, charges against Hawthorne were dropped with proof of an alibi, putting the investigation back to square one. With little new information coming in, the Algamy County Police began to suspect serial killer Edward Surratt for the disappearance of Beth, despite any sufficient evidence. At the time, Edward was serving two consecutive life sentences for rape and burglary in Florida. To help move things along, they called in the help from psychic Nancy Anderson, now Nancy Meyer. She sensed the route taken after the man took Beth, as well as the kidnapper's physical and personality makeup. Anderson even assisted by placing the witnesses under hypnosis in order to recall their memories better. One witness stated that the kidnapper waited about half an hour in his car near a bus stop on Beth's route before getting out of his car once he saw her. He approached her politely and Beth, in turn, extended her arms to him and was picked up and placed into his car without a struggle. For a little over a year, these visions and hypnosis statements were all the police had to go on until mid-March 1979. In Monroeville, about 15 minutes from Beth's home, in a wooded area, Joseph Lennard and his dogs came across a partially covered skeleton. The police were called, but sadly it was clear that the skeleton belonged to Beth. Still wearing her red pantsuit, blue tennis shoes, and plaid coat, the coroner later reported that Beth had died from multiple stab wounds to the chest. She had been dead since her disappearance. What makes Beth's case so odd are the circumstances surrounding it. When Beth's body was found, the police finally got back in touch with the woman from the bus stop. She asked about the car and was astounded that the car was found, but nothing more came from that investigation or her testimony. Along with this was Van, who was the son of a former Turtle Creek policeman, who said that his father was at Keeler's Hardware and a man bought a shovel and other things that raised alarm. It was called in, but nothing came of it. Of course, the man buying the supplies may have been starting a garden or had a pest problem, but the store was about 10 or so minutes away from Beth Street. But the worst part surrounding Beth's murder was that she was taken at the height of crime in Pennsylvania. Just weeks prior to Beth's kidnapping, the body of five-year-old Stephanie Ann Bowler was found in Brady's Run Park in Beaver Falls, five miles from Stephanie's home. She left the morning of January 8, 1977, wearing a green winter coat, black boots, and jeans. She walked to her friend's house, was told she was sick, and headed back home, but would never make it there. There was a massive search that spawned 175 plus volunteers and an unclaimed $5,000 reward. When her body was found, it was reported she had been hit in the back of the head and died from a skull fracture. Beaver Falls is approximately an hour away from Wilkinsburg. Stephanie's killer has never been identified. Other murders or disappearances during this period, including Frank Zellinger, who was found in his truck shot in the head, Joseph H. Wellneman and Catherine G. Wellneman. Joseph was found in his home with the right side of his skull bashed in, while Catherine was found in the driveway with her head bashed in and throat cut. She had also been raped. John Feeney and Rainey Gregor. Feeney had been shot in the neck, and Rainey was missing. Serial killer Edward Surratt confessed in 2007 to Feeney and Gregor's murders. Gregor's body would never be found. Richard and Donna Hyde. Richard was killed at home by a shotgun, and his wife was beaten to death with her body found two miles from their home. In Beaver County, William and Nancy Adams. William was killed with a shotgun in his home. Nancy is still missing. John and Catherine Skelkins. John was killed with a shotgun in his home. Catherine was beaten but survived. In Washington County, Susan E. Rush, who was strangled and stuffed into the trunk of her car, Debbie Kalopa, who was strangled and found three miles from her home. David Kennedy would be convicted of her murder. 
Brenda L. Ritter, who had been strangled, Mary I. Jensi, who had been beaten, and Barbara Lewis, who was found strangled in a dumpster. There have been books, blogs, and articles written about each murder I have listed, and even with witnesses and evidence, their cases still remain unsolved. If you have any information regarding Beth's murder or any of the following murders in her county, please call 412-473-1300. If you have any information regarding Stephanie's murder or any of the following murders in Beaver County, please call 724-770-4602. And if you have any information regarding any of the Washington County murders, please call 724-228-6840. Hopefully, one day, Beth, Stephanie, and everyone involved in the terrible crime spree of the 1970s can finally have peace. I'm Mrs. True Crime, and remember to be kind, be loud, be aware. I would like to give a large shout out to former journalist Zandi Dudek, who has worked for decades to help uncover Beth's murderer. Without her nonstop work ethic, we may not have known anything about Beth nor any of the murders surrounding the 1970s in Pennsylvania. So, for more information about Beth Lynn Barr, Stephanie Ann Bowler, or any of the cases listed, why not check out some of these awesome links? And if you like what you saw and heard today, why not drop a like and a comment? Maybe subscribe while you're here? <laughs> I make new videos every Tuesday and Friday, and you don't want to miss what's in store. <laughs>